Good morning, everybody. It is Ash Wednesday. It's also Valentine's Day in the United States. And I hope you put off your Valentine's Day or did it a day early or you're doing it later in the like on Saturday or something. I thank you for joining us during Lent. A fair number of people do take a, take a break from social media during Lent. So prayers for all of them that they may have a good and fruitful Lent. All right. Yeah, Lent. <laughs> Again, I got almost no sleep last night, unrelated to Lent or anything else going on. And so we're going to do the stream and we're going to get it. Uh, we're going to do it relatively quickly today, even though this is an interesting topic. There's a professor in, I believe, Italy who wrote a book called Habe Habemus Papam with a question mark. Do we have a pope? And he wrote this article responding to some criticisms of his work by Professor De Mattei. And Archbishop Vigano then responds to this article. And the challenge here that is issued is that everything we see going on in the Vatican lends itself naturally to people thinking that Francis is invalid for one reason or another. There are as many competing theories about that as there are people who are willing to even entertain them in the public eye. Andrea Cianciani is the one who's a subject here. He's an Italian who has the impeded C thesis. There are others out there with various other theses. And sort of the challenge here is the only people who can make, who can even begin to really give you a concrete answer to this that has any potential for binding or being frankly, probably lawful in the church are the Cardinals and they're silent on the issue. I can't think of a single Bishop who is not retired and frankly, deeply retired, like far deep into his retirement years who has taken a public stand on this. So there is throughout all of this, a series of challenges to the Cardinals. So if we're going to talk about Vigano's response to this, we should probably begin with the actual article itself that he's responding to from, which was published by Aldo Maria Valli, who's an, an Italian commentator on his own personal website. So he's very well connected. Um, it's a very good news source too, by the way. So the, the, um, the article is by Massimo Viglione, who wrote the book, Habemus Papam, which for those, actually, I will show it to you so you can see what I'm talking about here. I would get a copy of this book, but as you can see from its uh, its Amazon listing, it's only available in Italian. So it wouldn't do me any good. I, uh, I do not speak Italian. I could get a copy for $27, but then I don't know what I would do with it. So, um, But it's available for those who do read in Italian, who can read Italian. You can find it on Amazon and get it shipped to you. So... With all of that having been said, let's actually start with the article that Vigano responds to. It's not terribly long. We'll go over it and then uh, go over Vigano's response, which is also not super long. So it says, on February 1st of this year, Professor Roberto de Mattei reviewed my newly published book, Habemus Popham, in the periodically he directs. He gives up uh, that there's some lack of some bad. Uh, I think the article here is that Roberto de Mattei's uh, article is called Heretic Pope. He, meaning Benedict, gives up vacant office. The teachings of the past and the debate after the 11th of February, 2013. Um, and thanking the professor for his attention to my work, I found myself forced to make clarifications on some of his statements. Let's zoom in here. That I believe are incorrect and on some statements that are not true. Also because, as we will be able to see, conclusions about me that do not correspond to reality could be drawn from the discussion of him and is therefore my duty to clarify the truth in black and white. Since an in-depth treatment of the issue would require another book, I limit myself to a quick outline to clarify the main points. Roberto De Matei criticizes the, the author of this book for the following reason. If Fortunacini's Ratzinger is a genius for good thesis, for Villione he is a genius of evil, dialectically perfect. So the idea is the impeded C thesis is that Benedict only partially renounced his pap the papacy, right? And thus it impedes Francis from actually doing anything to the church, anything binding whatsoever. De, Roberto De Matei says that uh, uh, the Villione doesn't like the thesis because it turns Benedict into a villain, allowing the church to be just hammered by Francis and the modernists. You've, you may have heard that critique from others before. Here's how he responds to this. He says, this is not true because the words reported extrapolated from the context in which they are written are misleading. I affirm on the contrary, in the wake of other offers examined by me in the book who maintain the same, 
that Dr. Ciancini, and with him his numerous and noisy following, do not realize that if the so-called Ratzinger Code were true, Benedict XVI would indeed be a genius, but not for good, but for evil due to the deception perpetrated, unto the day of his passing, therefore for ten years, on the entire Catholic world. And not only, and that only an Italian journalist he would have been able to find out. Here, as proof of what has been said are my exact words, so quoting from his book, Furthermore, we agree with what Petruno, Don Di Sorco, and other authors of the debate have expressed. That is the fact that if Ratzinger had really done what Ciancini says, he would have deceived the entire Catholic world. And not only that, he would indeed be a genius, but of evil, not of good. The entire stubbornly Ratzingerian world doesn't even realize this clear evidence. I'm sorry for this incorrect use of my words. Since I believe that the Ratzinger Code is not true, it cannot be said that I believe Joseph Ratzinger was an evil genius. I would consider it so if the Ratzinger Code were true, but I don't think it is true. On the other hand, I believe, as explained in the book, that he was influenced in choosing him by his dialectical, theological, philosophical vision of both Hegelian roots in one sense and Ron Harian in another. But there is no evidence from my book that I consider him an evil genius. Just read the book to verify. So basically, the accusation is that he called Benedict an evil genius for resigning the papacy and leaving it in the hands of Francis. But that's not actually what he said, and he's clarifying that. Now, second point, we come to the sore point of Professor De Matei's reasoning, which calls into question my right to go to Mass Unicum. These are Masses said in union with Francis, where Francis's name is said during the actual consecration rite, as is any Mass in union with the reigning pontiff. It therefore seems that the professor endorses a sort of accusation of schism towards me, with all the consequences that this entails. They follow. Seems to me that Professor Dave Maffei did not did not grasp the profound and final meaning of my reasoning. That is the objective impossibility of possessing absolute certainty on the situation of authority in today's church. Almost the entire book is basically the demonstration of this assumption. In my opinion, this is irrefutable. For others, it is obviously not the case, but it certainly cannot be dismissed with inference about the personal conscience of others, based exclusively on the evident construction of the facts. The entire fourth part of the book demonstrates this impossibility. In any case, demonstrates that this is my thought. Just read the book to verify now, if I consider it impossible to have certainty, meaning he doesn't have certainty about the status of Francis, is it evident that I have no certainty? That is, we are in doubt, although, as I wrote, I can consider one of two solutions strongly probable, for the many reasons explained in the book. But strongly probable does not correspond to absolute certainty, neither in the Italian language nor in the theology. If there is no absolute certainty, there is no full awareness of the possible sin, and therefore there is no sin, because schism is a sin, and there is no deliberate consent i.e., in this case, the will itself of being a schismatic. Nor can we speak of a schismatic spirit for the simple reason that I am not posing these problems, as if I were a wild man under the pontificate of Pius XII, or even before, yada, yada, yada. You get the idea. The, the, the idea is this. If you have doubts about Francis's validity, are you, are you a schismatic for going to Mass as said in union with him? Yes or no? And the answer to that question is no, because it's these are not something anybody can have clarity on at this time. That is his point here. Now, many of you won't like that. That's his point. Okay, we're going over this so we can see what Vigano is responding to. He says in the book on page 251, after having described all the possible motivations, objective in themselves or exposed by other authors or deduced from perennial teaching of theology, such as the problem of the Pope dubious, just to give one possible example of the money, many we deal with, which push us to doubt the legitimacy of the current see, I write verbatim, quoting himself, because everything described in this book does not depend on us, no decision is up to us regarding the question of authority in the church. At most, we discuss it publicly, make videos or articles or books with the aim of posing the problem to the legitimate ecclesiastical hierarchies and opening the eyes of those who seek the truth without yet finding it, but nothing more than that. That's the key here. That all these, everybody pushing their hypothesis about what's going on is meant to put this stuff in the eye, in front of the eyes of the proper church authorities who are the ones who should do something about it. But you notice they don't do anything. Except for just say Francis is the Pope. He's been accepted by the world as Pope. Case closed. When at least, you know, I may not agree with all the hypotheses out there, but at least there are people digging into the question and giving you reasons based on Catholic theology and canon law and any other way to approach it that seems at least valid. Most of the better bishops who reject all of this do it without really examining the question and giving it a fair shake. So he continues saying, on the other hand, we can only suspend judgment and wait for those responsible to act or for the facts to unravel the situation or for God himself to intervene. 
Until that moment, we are simple and faithful children of the church in a historic moment and in the conditions in which the Lord wanted us to live. And this is exactly what I, Massimo Filione, a simple lay Catholic, do. And I have stuck to this with this book. And he goes on to refute other things. Um, they're not actually, and he, he like Roberto de Matei called him a set of privationist. Um, and uh, the author actually finds everything wrong with set of privationism. I mean, the, the set of privationism is different than set of accountism. The idea that, yeah, this person's Pope, but they've lost all their authority because they're the Pope, you know, because of their heresies or whatnot. There are a whole lot of different positions instead of a contism and recognize and resist. There's a whole lot of these others. Um, so <laughs> D says, give up on Pope Francis for Lent. <laughs> Max says, I picked a fun time to convert to Catholicism. The thing is, we're just more aware than people were even 10 years ago. That's it. That's all it is. Um, so we're going to now go to what Vigano has to say, because Vigano actually issued this letter on the, um, on the web on his website, which has not been terribly active recently, by the way, I just, the only letter he's published in the last couple of months was about secular political things. And he did it in his such over the top spicy language that I couldn't even begin to report on it here. And frankly, I'm like less interested in the secular political stuff, except when he directly links it to what's going on in the church, just personal bias of mine. But I do recommend people do check out the Exerge Domine website. Um, he only issued this in Italian, so we had to use a translation extension here. So again, let's be careful. Let's be aware of the um, some of the hangups that are going to be in some of the syntax here. But uh, he's uh, responding essentially to this professor here, What you the, the excerpt I gave you from that last article. So Habemus Papam, the recent essay by Professor Massimo Villione, asks a question that only 11 years ago was unthinkable, and unthinkable for the average Catholic and perhaps even for a canonist, since the errors and deviations of Vatican II had not yet become evident in their disruptive evidence, arriving to be affirmed hours round by the one who should have instead condemned them. That means that he's confirming errors that had been stewing under the surface, if you want to say they're under the surface, caused by the council and uh, made manifest for everybody, right? Let's think about Amoris Laetitia, the provisions with which the doctrine on the ultimate penalty the state can impose was modified, or the latest scandalous declaration of fiducia supplicants, contested by entire Episcopal conferences. By this, I mean that the recent awakening of many Catholics, among which I cannot fail to include myself, in the path of returning to tradition in recent years, allows us to understand, even just intuitively, through the census fide, that we would never have... We could never have seen a Roman basilica desecrated by a simulation of a mass by a fake Anglican bishop without first Montini's embrace with no less heretical patriarch Athenagoras or the meetings in Assisi and the visits to the uh, temples by Woltia and Ratzinger, meaning John Paul II and Ratzinger. To American ears, saying uh, calling a pope by his his birth name sounds weird to us and impious, but it, that's a European tradition going back to centuries. And Vigano's Italian, so cut him some slack. And that if today Bergoglio is preparing to access the priesthood for women, this is due to the tampering with holy orders begun by Paul VI with the reckless suppression of the minor orders and the subdiaconate, always in a pro-Protestant ecumenical key. What in my opinion is the indisputable merit of this work by Professor Villione is not only the fact that he was able to list synthetically and clearly the various theses regarding the Catholic response to the manifest heresy, heresy of the pontiff in the affair of the renunciation of Benedict XVI, but also and above all, having finally asked the crucial question, do we have a Pope? Because it is this question, precisely in its terrible implications, that no one had dared to ask the general public until now, limiting themselves to academic speculation or marginal ecclesial realities. This is the question courageously asked by the author of an essay, which I can only highly recommend careful reading. And unfortunately, the essay is published in the form of a book in Italian, and I have not found any evidence that it's coming out in English anytime soon. So. If somebody from like one of the braver uh, Catholic publishing houses here in the uh, English speaking world is watching this, see if you can get the rights to the uh, to the English language edition of this and publish it. And I will happily, happily, happily let the audience know about this because this is an important subject and it's important that the that we know what the different options are, but also know what the hierarchy should be doing in this because 
it, it's clear there's something wrong, very seriously wrong in Rome, and the proper church authorities need to step up. This is a book that will provoke discussion because it makes comprehensible a debate hitherto confined to the academic disquisitions of a few critics of the present, quote, pontificate, or disseminated by figures who have exploited and polarized the conflict to gain visibility. The merit of Villione is to have brought the question back onto the tracks of a healthy realism, sine ere et studio, and to have made it understandable by analyzing the different positions no longer on the mere hypothesis of a heretical pope, but on the painful evidence of Jorge Mario's heresy and on the answers advanced so far. The author does not limit himself to the simple enumeration of the theses, but shows the critical issues of some and the plausibility of others. Among the latter, the one formulated by me on the defect of consent, which would nullify Bergoglio's assumption of the papacy due to a deliberate malicious will to appropriate it, to use it in a way opposite to the purposes that the divine founder of the church, our Lord, gave it. Here is, this is Vigano's thesis on why Francis may not be the Pope. It's because he had a defect of the will when he assumed the papacy, that he did not intend to do what popes do, he did not intend to do what the church would have popes do that he intended instead to tear the church down and build a new religion. That is what he is. That is his thesis. He says, another thesis of great value, and for this reason rightly addressed by the author, is that of Professor Enrico Mar Maria Radelli, relating to the anomaly of renunciation and the invention of the papacy emeritus. I share Villione's persuasion regarding the irrelevance and rigor of this analysis, especially if it is integrated with the Vitium consensus of Benedict XVI's successor, as suggested by Rodelli himself and read in the light of Ratzinger's dialectical Hegelianism. The professor, Villione, does not intend to provide definitive answers, but first of all to ensure that the topic is addressed and discussed, because only by an honest awareness of the Bergoglio problem can we delve deeper into the doctrine of the papacy and those aspects of the doctrines of the church and the canonists of the past, they conceived it as a remote eventuality, while for the Catholics taken of the synodal church, they showed themselves as real. Meaning, theologians of the past, the doctors of the church, never delved as deeply into this issue as would have been really good for them to do. And councils never conceived of this. Popes didn't really think of it because it just seemed like a remote possibility that could possibly maybe happen at some distant point in the future. But now we are all in the grips of the synodal church and we all live with this reality every single day, that of a heretic Pope. And what is the court? What's the recourse? Again, the we've heard different things from members of the hierarchy. We've heard Cardinal Burke say that there could be some kind of imperfect council trial thing. There are doctors of the church who disagree with that. There are theologians today who disagree with that. There is no clarity here. If, if there is any situation in the church that makes the alleged Sister Lucia and her words, we say alleged because it came from the 1960s after most people think Sister Lucia was replaced, but the words still ring true. The diabolic disorientation that's entered the church. There is no situation in the church uh, aside from where we are today, that makes that those words ring more true than the situation of Francis the Great and Merciful and what he's been doing to the church. Let's continue. In the list of theses on the vacancy of the apostolic see, the font of canonical ruminations of the Ratzinger Code by Andrea Cianchini and his followers could not fail to be mentioned. The reader will not be unaware of the inconsistency of the phantom theory of the impeded seat, which co constitutes a false premise that invalidates the entire reasoning, as well as casting, as the author points out, disturbing shadows on the honesty and correctness of Benedict XVI's actions. So clearly, Vigano's not a fan of, of Dr. Cianchini's thesis. Believing that he was able to send cryptic messages aimed at a small circle of initiates, basing this belief on completely questionable and circumstantial facts, a belief that has become incontrovertible proof and obsessively imposed as dogmatic truth, relegates Cioncini and company speculation to the genre of fantasy borrowed from Dan Brown. Ouch. I would uh, I would add um, it does that thesis, at least the adherence to it, some of the adherence do remind me of. In the secular world, that person who, on the internet who was giving cryptic messages about how in the United States things were about to turn around, that there was a big plan, uh, go to the letter R, minus one on the alphabet from there. Yes, that that term is absolutely flagged on YouTube, I know, for a fact that it is. But that person, that it, it does kind of have a whiff similar to that. Now, um, that having been said... I do think his thesis should also be given given a fair treatment by the proper ecclesiastical authorities. 
Vigano continues saying, of course, the pontificate of Jorge Mario Bergoglio is a Greek word, <laughs> a unique case in the entire 2000 year history of the church, both for the methods that brought the Argentine Jesuit to the throne of Peter and for the clear complicity of the embedded church in this subversive plan. And finally, for the mirror nature of Bergoglio's actions within the church as a leading exponent of the embedded church compared to that of the em embedded system in Western nations. But this unicum is the poisoned fruit of a malapia whose ideological roots lie in the neo-modernism of Vatican II, which managed to combine the devolution of the sacred authority of the Roman pontiff to assembly bodies of a democratic mix with the progressive transformation of the Pope into a tyrant divinus legibus solitus. In fact, if an institution separates the exercise of power from the necessary subordination to the authority of Christ the King and pontiff, who is its supreme guarantor, it loses all its legitimacy and can only become, as has already happened in the civil sphere, an expression of lobby and interest without any restraint. The paradox and the satanic cunning of this ecclesial takeover consisted in maintaining the appearances of the papacy for the sole purpose of being able to demand obedience from those who still believe that whoever sits on the throne of Peter is the vicar of Christ chosen by the Holy Spirit, while in reality he is a mercenary who abuses the trust and respect of the faithful to disperse them. Ouch. The same phenomenon is happening in temporal governments, where rulers claim unlimited power, even to the point of um, mass removal, over their citizens, under the illusion that those who represent them in parliaments have the common good as their aim. And it is no coincidence that this democratic um, strong arm was only possible after having ousted our Lord from his lordship over the nations. What still gives hope for an awakening of consciousness is that the reactions of lay people, priests, bishops, and even part of the profane world in front of the vexed question are not of scandal or amazement, but of total awareness of the Bergoglio problem. Professor Villione also notes the contradiction of those who on the one hand are aware and denounce the deviations of the Argentine Jesuit, but on the other hand, do not believe that this has any consequence on his recognition as Pope, limiting themselves to considering his actions as non-magisterial interventions to which obedience is not due. It is to be hoped that the broadening of the audience of Catholics informed on the topic will make it possible to clarify the most inconsistent positions of a a priori official defense, which risks bordering on open complicity. That's a call out to the Pope's planners who do mental gymnastics to defend Francis. And they do it most of the time from a love for the church. Never forget that, that the Pope's planners that we like to take to task, even the ones that kind of make themselves into a joke in their constant defense of Francis. They do it from a, from having a love of the church. I know that's hard for some people to hear. This is why I don't make fun of any of them other than to maybe make fun of the concept of being a Pope splainer in this day and age, but most of them love the church. Okay. Let's extend some charity. In fact, let's make that a Lenten resolution to try to extend some charity to those who oppose our positions on the Bergoglio question. Okay. Because while we should definitely correct errors and even make fun of some of these like mental gymnastics, at the end of the day, these are people who do love the church. There may be exceptions to that rule. I'll leave you to decide that, especially maybe anybody out there who casts aspersions with a wide giant net on those trying to wake people up to the crazy things going on in the church these days. Let's continue. What is therefore practically unanimously received, recognized by Catholics is the anomaly of the current, quote, papacy, an anomaly of which progressives are enthusiastic and which conservatives and traditionalists consider unprecedented and scandalous, but of which everyone is aware, from the professor of the Roman university to the simple unbaptized person. Meaning if you're paying attention at all, a lot, even, not a, even a lot of non-Catholics are aware there's something seriously wrong in Rome. The responses to this anomaly represent the attempt to find a solution to the crisis we're going through, which is unique in its kind, and which, I would like to reiterate, cannot be judged according to the ordinary parameters of a legal system designed for conditions of relative normality. In fact, we find ourselves faced with a betrayal that does not only involve some sectors of the institution, but all its body, starting from the top. A betrayal that began 60 years ago with the abdication of the hierarchy from its duty to preach the gospel of Christ against the anti-gospel of the world. A betrayal carried out with the destruction of the mass and the liturgy, precisely because the subverters know well the pedagogical powers of rites and gestures in the transmission of the faith. And just as in schools, people are indoctrinated into a certain way of thinking with cancel culture, so in the Church's entire generations have been indoctrinated in ecumenism, in contempt for their past, in the acceptance of demands incompatible with the Catholic magisterium. 
and all this scandalously with the ratification of the authority, or rather under its deliberate push, both in civil and ecclesial spheres. The question we must therefore ask ourselves is not only Habemus Popham, is there a pope, but how it was possible to silently witness a systematic infiltration into the church of heretics and corrupt people whose ideas and purposes were widely known. And what is the responsibility of the hierarchy, starting with the popes of the council, without exception, in this reckless and certainly disastrous substitution, especially when the destructive potential of this subversive operation was evident from the beginning, and there was still a way to remedy. Jorge Mario Bergoglio's recent action is perfectly consistent with the work of doctrine moral, disciplinary, and liturgical erosion carried out from pontificate of John the Twenty-Third, and never interrupted. Even in the face of the disastrous emptying of the church, seminaries, convents, and Catholic schools. Indeed, one might think that the failure to intervene in the face of this patent failure is a confirmation of premeditation and malice on the part of someone who has never had the humility to question his fallacious certainties. Here, too, the parallel with the embedded system is evident because in both cases, the declared purpose, fostering the church's dialogue with the modern world or making the liturgy understandable to the faithful on the one hand and containing a, the bad stuff that happened four years ago or coping with, with the uh, thermometer problem on the other, just to give two examples, are lies that serve to distract from the real objective, which is criminal and, and unspeakable. If the disillusion of the state is evident in the betrayal of the rulers and their subservience to the to the, our betters <laughs> with the aim of reducing the total number of everyone and putting the rest into servitude, no less evident is the dissolution of the church in its most human component, obviously, in the betrayal of the majority of the Catholic hierarchy, also subservient to the same ministers with the aim of uh, eliminating the catacomb, which prevents the mystery of iniquity from manifesting itself. As I've already recalled, we are not in a church whose hierarchy is Catholic, and we find a pope who professes heresy, but who at the same time is sincerely intent on shepherding the flock of the Lord, but rather in front of a church eclipsed by a state, in which every dicastery, every university, every seminary, every diocese, every parish, every convent are directed and managed by the embedded church, and ostracism and persecution opened anyone who dissents, even limiting themselves to the recent magisterium without questioning the council. We have conf confirmation of this from the total self-referentiality of Bergoglio's so-called magisterium, as enthusiastically reiterated by Prefect Tuco. It is enough to scroll through the references to the sources in the papal documents to understand that Bergoglio's teaching is deliberately new compared to that of his immediate predecessors, but only in the forced way, since the principles to which Bergoglio refers constant are exactly the same as the conciliar popes. We could say, to simplify, that Bergoglio is to the Jacobins' Robespierre as Ratzinger is to the Girondist Brousseau, both, however, supporters of the revolution. Meaning, Vigano is saying something very unpopular there. He's reminding everybody that every single pope since the council has contributed to this problem. That Francis is the logical extension of this. He's the logical, like, final stage of this. That every single one of them helped because every single one of them participated in tearing down the liturgy, tearing down the sacraments and re rebuilding them in their own image, and of rejecting the social reign of Christ the King which goes back to Archbishop Lefebvre and his great debate with Cardinal Ratzinger, handled in letters, in private, published later, and he could not get Cardinal Ratzinger as prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in the 1980s to affirm the Church's traditional doctrine on the social reign of Christ the King. Take all the time you need to think about that. And I say that as someone who generally thinks positively of Benedict, though not as positively as most of you tend to. So here's how Vigano closes this. Habemus Popham, heretical pope, renunciation, vacant seat, constitutes a precious contribution to the understanding of a now undeniable phenomenon, conceived not as a sterile academic test, but for the love of the church and the papacy, totally today humiliated and discredited by a hierarchy, subservient to the world, regardless of the loss of many souls for whom the Lord shed his blood. Therefore, let the same love for the church and the papacy guide its reading. Signed Archbishop Vigano on the 5th of February, 2024, on the Feast of St. Agatha. He like he also likes to publish things on the day, on uh, on on feast days that are important. So there's the book for those who may try to find a copy. If you read Italian, I wish you luck if you do, because again, I would absolutely love to see an English language translation of that book available. But there is no cop. There's no pub. Nobody's got an English one. So please, if you are if you are a 
someone who works at a publishing house watching this, consider trying to get a copy of this. I guarantee you, you're going to sell lots of copies in the United States. And I will happily, happily let the audience know about it. And I'm not asking for any monetary compensation for doing it. It's an important topic. All right. So let's see. Apparently, uh, is there a way to remove Francis? Uh, let's see. Um, okay. So what's going on here? There's somebody in the chat causing problems because I was reading the full thing. Let me just go here. I wrote the book, but it's my world. What? I know this is great things to watch later on. I apologize. You know what? Bye. I just <laughs> normally people here in my chat don't ask for people to be banned, but I will just take care of it. So, all right, folks. What? Let's. I wish for Vigano was Pope far closer to Christ. It seems. Well, uh, Vigano will never be Pope, and I know that that's hard for some people to hear, but Vigano, there is a. There is something to understand in the hierarchy, and that is this, it's almost like a trust. And when he began calling out the hierarchy, when he began calling out Francis the way he did, he violated the trust in the eyes of the bishops, who are the cardinals, who make that decision of who becomes Pope. And aside from the fact that Vigano is also in his 80s now, <laughs> which means the chances are near zero anyway for anybody who gets that advanced age, Despite the fact that Vigano has been right on most things, it does not matter because a, there is a sort of se sense of trust in the College of Cardinals. And Vigano is not even a cardinal anyway. If you are not a cardinal, the chance of becoming pope gets greatly reduced. There hasn't been a non-cardinal elected pope in a very, very long time. Um, I don't think there's anybody in the College of Cardinals even as remotely close to it as good as, as Vigano either on this, unfortunately. Um... All right, folks. I do ask the bishops he will stop the secular concerts in the cathedral. He said he will allow whatever the church allows. Oh, boy. Yes, there are some cathedrals in the United States and in the West that allow secular concerts in their cathedrals. And this isn't just like allowing a Christian rock band. And I mean, like, I don't mean a rock band comprised of Christians, of which there are many who out there of all any genre you care to name of rock music. I mean, self styled christian rock bands they make their music is predominantly christian in nature and they get sometimes in some places they get they play shows in cathedrals and that's bad enough i don't think that should happen there but you do sometimes see cathedrals rented out for secular purposes not that different than what has happened with uh, canterbury that i reported on a few days ago Kennedy Hall speaks Italian. Yeah, he should actually get a copy of this. Kennedy, if you see, if, if you watch this, please get a copy of this book and do a video. I will let people know uh, about your report on it if you do, or maybe we'll have you come on and describe all of these because <laughs> I know you, you'd be able to present things in a fair way, even positions you don't agree with. All right, folks. If there's any final thoughts in here, um, please let me know. It is again Ash Wednesday. Take your Lent seriously this year, whatever you're going to do. Don't just do the minimum. Try to do some other things in addition as well. Um, all right, folks. Rooster actually says he likes death metal Christian rock. There actually are Christian bands of that genre, of that specific version of metal out there. There are. They exist. Like I said, there's a Christian variant of anything you can think of out there. It's amazing to think about. I won't go into many more details, but they, but that actually exists. All right, folks, I can't take a break, but I'm actually about to sign off on this stream because the stream has gone a little long. I didn't think it would quite take this long and I didn't even go over uh, the professor's full letter. I just went over Vigano's full letter. So thanks very much folks. And uh, as always pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.